Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. This week, I accomplished something that at first I really didn't think was going to be possible, and so I wanted to both document it for posterity and share the adventure with you. I custom-built my own kernel for the original BSD Unix operating system from the original sources, configured it, and deployed it to my real PDP-1183, where it's now humming along nicely. And so today, we're diving into the arcane knowledge needed to configure, compile, link, and install the Unix kernel. It's a pretty niche topic, which is why I'm excited to let you know that today's episode is sponsored by Walmart and Bass Pro Shops. No, I'm kidding. That'd be nice, though. Making an episode about building the Unix kernel is about as smart as trying to build the Unix kernel by yourself, but I'm a glutton for punishment, so here we are. And note that I didn't say Linux, I said Unix. The real deal, better known as 2.11 BSD. If you think of yourself as a knowledgeable PC builder, you're in for quite a historical ride. And by the end, you'll have seen the entire process from logging in to compiling to actually booting your new kernel. I absolutely guarantee that you'll be 50% smarter by the end of this episode. Not a guarantee. Today's episode is a tale of triumph, frustration, and some of the deepest dives into computer history that you can imagine. It's the story of how I restored and maxed out a PDP-1183, a system that's both a relic of its time and a shining example of what computing once was. Big dual RLO2 removable disk packs, 4 megabytes of memory, an RQDX3 disk controller, a DHV11 8 port serial board, dual floppies, MFM drives. It's the kind of hardware loadout that could make any vintage computing enthusiast smile. But don't let the nostalgic glow fool you. Restoring a PDP 1183 isn't just a trip down memory lane, it's a lesson in perseverance. Every step of the way, I was reminded that while these machines were marvels of their time, they also demanded a deep understanding of their inner workings, and a willingness to get your hands dirty. Now, to understand why this restoration was such a monumental task, we need to take a step back and appreciate what the PDP-11 represented. Launched in 1970 by Digital Equipment Corporation, or DEC, the PDP-11 series quickly became one of the most popular mini-computers of the era. And it was only mini in comparison to the enormous mainframes. It was revolutionary for its time, introducing the Unibus and later Qbus architectures, which simplified system design and expanded modularity. The PDP-1183, my chosen platform, came out in the very early 80s and was part of the J11 family, which featured an advanced CMOS implementation of the PDP-11 instruction set. What made the PDP-1183 special wasn't just its raw computing power, though by many computer standards it was impressive. It could address up to 4 megabytes of memory, had advanced peripheral support, and ran Unix. That's right, Unix, the operating system that would become the foundation for so much of modern OS design, was alive and well on the PDP-11. But of course, Unix on a 16-bit architecture came with a host of challenges. The first hurdle was memory. The PDP-11 is limited to a 16-bit address space, meaning it could only address 64 kilobytes at a time. DEC engineers pushed the boundaries of what was possible by splitting instructions and data into separate 64 kilobyte spaces, giving the system a combined addressability of 128 kilobytes. However, this division introduced its own challenges, particularly for Unix, which had to fit both its kernel and application code into these tight confines. Now, if you've ever dabbled with modern Linux or even early DOS, you know that the kernel is the heart of any operating system. It manages the hardware, schedules tasks, and handles system calls from applications. On the PDP-11, the Unix kernel's small memory footprint meant that it couldn't support every conceivable hardware device right out of the box. And that's where the real work began. Back in those days, configuring a system was an art form. If you added a Sound Blaster card to a PC in the early 90s, you probably remember fiddling with config.sys and setting IRQs, DMA channels, and I.O. ports. It seems complicated, but compared to configuring a PDP-11 running BSD-211 Unix, it was child's play. Under BSD, device drivers aren't loadable. You can't just drop a new driver into a folder or edit in any file and reboot. If you wanted support for a new piece of hardware, you had to build it directly into the kernel. The process begins with a trip to user source sys, where the kernel source code lives. And this isn't just a couple of files. It's an entire directory filled with C code and assembly routines. First, you'd copy your existing configuration file, name it after your system, and then start editing. Each line represented a device or a feature, RLO2 drives, networking, serial ports, and so on. You'd turn features on or off depending on your needs and the constraints of your setup. And here's where it got tricky, because the kernel had to fit within that 64 kilobyte limit for instructions, and even though you could use overlays to swap in additional code dynamically, managing them is no small feat. Overlays allow you to extend the kernel's functionality by loading code segments in and out of memory as needed, but only 8 kilobytes of space was reserved for them. Moreover, certain parts of the kernel couldn't be overlaid at all. 
Critical routines that required for booting or hardware initialization had to stay in the base section of memory. The configuration system, while powerful, wasn't exactly user-friendly. After you edited your config file, you'd run a script that generated a make file, which is a set of instructions for building the kernel. However, the make file's default overlay layout almost never worked with a custom configuration. That meant manually shuffling functions between the base and the overlays, often through simple trial and error. If you guessed wrong and placed a critical function in an overlay, the system wouldn't boot, and you'd be left staring at a blinking cursor, wondering where it all went wrong. And I spent nearly two days or more locked into this battle. And now, none of this would have been possible, or at least it would have taken much, much longer, without the dedicated help of a person named Clem Cole. Clem's a Unix wizard going back to the mid-1970s, I'm told, and I believe he was at Berkeley and may have worked at Digital as well. And so Clem has a long and colorful 50-year career in the tech industry, but it's his specific Unix and BSD experience that really came in handy. I must have sent him at least two dozen emails, probably more, over the course of the week or so, and he was very diligent in answering everything I asked pretty promptly with as best an answer as you can give on a topic that's 40 years old and you're working from memory. Most of the time... He was spot on, so thanks, Clem. Every compilation felt like I was rolling the dice, hoping I'd finally struck the right balance. And then after countless iterations, it finally worked. The kernel compiled and linked successfully, and the features I needed were all included, and it fit within the strict memory limits. It was a moment of triumph until I tried to boot the system. The PDP-11 roared to life, and the RL02 drive spun up and then crashed. Kernel panic. I traced the issue back to networking, or at least I was pretty sure, and it turns out that BSD211 requires a second binary, Netnix, to be present in the root directory alongside the main Unix binary. It's a small detail, but one that brought everything to a grinding halt, because I didn't know that. Once I copied Netnix into place, the system finally booted cleanly. As the PDP-1183 came to life, I was reminded of the era that it represented. This was a time when computing wasn't just about results, it was about understanding. You didn't simply install software, you configured and compiled it and customized it to fit your hardware like a custom-tailored suit. Every blinking light on the console, every hum of the RL02 drive, spoke to the engineering marvels of the time and the dedication of the uber-nerds that set these things up for a living some 40 years ago. Now here's the thing about kernel development on vintage hardware. Speed is not its strong suit. Compiling a kernel on the real PDP-11 machine takes about an hour. That's 60 minutes of biting your nails and hoping the stars align and that the thing compiles, let alone links. But there is a better way, at least for these early developmental stages. Enter OpenSimH, the venerable PDP-11 emulator. This powerhouse lets me build a kernel in a brisk 50 seconds. Compare that to the glacial pace of the real hardware and it's kind of a no-brainer. My plan was simple, get everything working in the emulator first and then transfer the configuration and newfound wisdom to the real machine. And that's where things took a turn for the strange. The first snag was something I had not anticipated. When I mounted my BSD disk image in the emulator, the image file ballooned to multiple gigabytes in size. Now, this isn't normal behavior for a PDP-11 disk image, certainly not one that's supposed to fit into a 20 megabyte MFM drive. It seemed like SimH was probing for available disk space and interpreting the vast amount of free space on the modern host system as a green light to expand the file system to the maximum possible size. The result? A giant, unwieldy disk image that no PDP-11 could ever load. While I wrestled with the emulator, I also had to face the realities of my actual hardware. The RL02 drives, for all their charm, can only hold 10 megabytes apiece. Even the mighty MFM drive tops out at 20 megabytes. BSD and its source code and all tools simply wouldn't fit. And that's where the Cubone card came in, a marvel of modern engineering designed specifically for these kinds of retrocomputing challenges. The Cubone plugs into the PDP-11's Cubus and can emulate almost any device you need, Disk controllers, RAM, or even networking hardware, it's like having a digital Swiss Army knife for your vintage machine. The Cubone is a card from RetroCMP.com that plugs into the system's bus like any other card, but it can respond to bus requests for a range of simulated devices, from system memory to complete disk packs. In my case, the Cubone was doing double duty. First, it provided an additional 2 megabytes of Cubus memory, a significant expansion for a PDP-11. Second, it emulated two RA92 drives, each with a whopping 1 gigabyte capacity. With these virtual drives in place, I had more than enough room to hold BSD, the source code, and all my experiments. But as you might have guessed, adding this kind of virtual hardware is never exactly plug and play. Once I had the kernel booting from the Cubone, it was time to start enabling the actual features that I need. And that's where things got messy. So it wasn't just dealing with virtual devices, I also had a physical RQDX3 disk controller in the mix. 
And in the world of DEX systems, every piece of hardware gets its own CSR, or control and status register. It's a location in memory, and then there's an interrupt vector. It's a bit like giving every device its own mailing address on the Q bus. If two devices share the same address, chaos ensues. In a way, the device's CSR is like its home address, and the interrupt vector is like the doorbell. When a package is being delivered to the address, the bell notifies the occupants inside that the front door needs attention. That's kind of my hand-wavy explanation for today, at least. Now, I had carefully configured the CSR addresses so as not to overlap, but there was a twist. I was booting off the Cubone's virtual drive, which I had carefully configured as a secondary controller so as not to overlap with the real one. That meant the primary controller, the physical RQDX3, was being ignored during the boot, and its drives did not show up in the system at all. The solution? Well, it's time to break out the jumper pins and wire wrapping tools because that's how you change the options on a PDP-11 card. Now, the disk controller actually uses jumper blocks, but the serial card uses dip switches and the memory boards use manual wire wrapping. So it's kind of hit or miss what you're gonna get. I pulled the RQDX3 out of the machine and reconfigured it to act as the secondary controller. Then I made the Cubo and virtual drive the primary. With the roles reversed, I rebooted, and there they were. For the first time, all the drives, both virtual and physical, appeared in the system. It was a small victory, but as any vintage computing enthusiast will tell you, seeing all your devices properly enumerated is a moment worth celebrating. With the drive visible, I moved on to the next task, formatting and mounting. The MFM hard drive and the RL02 floppy were ready to go. But the second floppy stubbornly refused to cooperate. No matter what I tried, it remained inaccessible. After some digging, I discovered the root of the problem the kernel's hard-coded limit on the number of MSCP drives. The default configuration simply didn't account for the number of devices I was now using. So back to the drawing board, or more accurately, back to user source sys. I edited the configuration file, increasing the limits for MSCP drives, and started the compile process all over again. It was another reminder of the delicate balancing act required to customize a PDP-11 kernel. Every change, no matter how small, had to be carefully coded, considered, and compiled, and then tested. Because after all, if you change three things at once, then the system won't boot. Which one was the cause? And so the saga continues. With each new step forward, new challenges emerge, but that's kind of the beauty of working with systems like the 1183. It's not just about getting the machine to work. It's about understanding how it works and solving the puzzles that it throws your way. For completeness, I'm going to take you through the entire process from logging in to booting the new kernel. And with that, let's drop into the shell. First, we need to change directories into user source sys, where we find a set of configuration files with all caps file names. Basically, you want to pick the one that's closest to your desired configuration, or the generic one if you're unsure, and then copy it to a new file. The machine I'm building this for is going to be called Minerva, so that's what I will name my configuration file in all caps. Next, I'll use VI to edit that file. We can scroll past the first 30 or so lines until we get to the section on which type of PDP-11 that we have. Ours is an 1183, so we'll update this entry to reflect that. Our next step is to name the system on the ident line. The name for the prior config was simh, but we will change ours to be Minerva. Next, I'll up the maximum number of users from 10 to 16 to make room for more visitors. Each additional user requires some additional memory, but we'll see what we can fit in. This next part I'm not entirely sure about. I eliminate the dump routine entirely in the hopes that it saves some memory. I do that by setting the dump dev to no dev and dump device to null dev. Down in the disk drive section, we have the opportunity to update the counts of each device type. We have two controllers, so I set NRAC to two. I now have a total of five MSCP drives, so I up that total here. I don't have any RK05 drives connected, but I do have two RL02 drives. I also have a dual floppy that counts as two. We can save a bit of memory by setting the number of tape drives to zero, which will eliminate the need to link that code into the kernel at all. In the terminal section, I will leave NKL as two, as I have two total serial boards, and so that seems right. One of them is a DHV11, so I'll set DHV to one. One mistake when I made when I was recording this video was that I forgot to set NDM to zero. Since I don't have a DM11 board, I don't need that driver. Now this config file was already set up for Ethernet, but we want to ensure that NQE gets set to 1 and NQT goes to 0, as that reflects the DEQNA card that I have installed. At the bottom of the file is our final change. I'm going to turn off the ingress driver, as we won't be using it. When we're satisfied with the results, we save the file and then launch the script called config with our file as the argument. That will run a process that generates the custom headers and copies the standard and remaining ones into a new folder named after your configuration file, but in the parent directory. 
Now in a simpler world, we'd simply change into that new Minerva folder and run make. And we could do that, but it wouldn't build because we haven't reconfigured the base and overlay sections yet. To simplify that, I've already figured out through long trial and error what needs to go where, so my work here will be to delete the lines in the make file that were automatically generated and paste in my handcrafted sections. We can then save the make file and run make clean in order to make sure there's no floatsome or jetsome in the folder before we run make for real. As noted earlier, when I'm experimenting with everything trying to fit into memory, I do it in an emulator session because compiling is so much faster. It takes about an hour on the real hardware, as I said, versus 50 seconds on the emulator, so I tinker in the emulator session until I get everything working and then I do it one final time on the real hardware. Here you can see a comparison in build speed with the real machine on the left and the emulator on the right. Back to our actual build, we'll fast forward to the linker phase where the real magic happens. This is where we find out that everything was able to fit. And thanks to many, many hours of tinkering, this layout actually works and produces a usable kernel. To deploy the kernel, we copy the two files that were generated to the root of the file system, Unix and Netnix. With that, we can shut the machine down safely, then sync the disks, and then finally halt the machine. That should return us to the simulator where I can never remember the command to restart the thing, so I'll just restart the entire emulator. And the good news is that it boots. Once the system comes up, we'll enter multi-user mode by pressing Ctrl D, and when we get to the boot prompt, I'll log in as Dave. Once I do, I'll run the uname command to see what kernel we're actually running. And sure enough, the kernel is our new custom-built Minerva kernel. And so with that, you've at least seen an overview of the entire archaic process of building your own kernel for a classic Unix system. If you found today's adventure to be any combination of informative or entertaining, remember I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so I'd be honored if you'd consider subscribing to my channel and leaving a like on the video before you go today. Please consider turning on the notification bell, and if you want to share this episode with somebody you think might enjoy it, click on the share button and do the copy link, and then you can send it however you like. Please be sure to check out our weekly viewer shop talk Q&A on the second channel, Dave's Attic. We'd really appreciate the views if you'd check out an episode, and hopefully you'll come back for more and subscribe there as well. Check out the free sample of my book on Amazon, link in the video description. It's everything I know now about living your best life on the spectrum that I wish I'd known long ago. Thanks for joining me out here in the shop today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.